Uh, that's why a distinguished uh, honor to uh, introduce Professor Harini Nagendra uh, from Azim Premji University in Bangalore, India. Uh, Professor Nagendra has a career defined by excellence and inter interdisciplinarity. Um, her, she got her PhD in the, from the Center of Ecological Sciences at the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, since the year 2000, she has been the Asia Research Coordinator uh, at the Center for the Study of Institutions, Population, and Environmental Change at Indiana University. And it was in the early 2000s when I first met uh, Harini and got to know her well and learned uh, much about her work. And uh, this is the reason why we have, one of the reasons why we have her here today because um, she is uh, a fantastic interdisciplinary researcher. Um, she has worked with uh, Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom. I'm sure you've all heard of her name. She is the first woman to win the um, Nobel Prize in Economics. Uh, Harini was a Bronco Weiss Fellow at ETH Zurich. Uh, she was a DST Ramanujan Fellow at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment. She was also the Hubert Humphrey Distinguished Visiting Professor at McAllister College in the United States. Uh, Professor Nagendra is a highly regarded interdisciplinary scientist. Her research methods integrate Earth observation with field studies of biodiversity and social institutional surveys of human environment interactions. She draws on satellite remote sensing, GIS, landscape ecology, vegetation studies, institutional analysis, environmental analysis, and field interviews. She has published more than 100 peer-reviewed uh, papers and book chapters on several um, subjects, including uh, urban ecology, human drivers of land use and land cover change, multi-scale biodiversity assessments, and local institutions and livelihoods, particularly in the context of common pool resources. She's a scientific committee member of the International Council for Science, the Program on Ecosystem Change and Society. She's a lead author for the Working Group 3 of the IPCC FIP assessment. She's a scientific committee member of Diversitas and a scientific steering committee member of the Global Land Project. Among her many awards include uh, the PNAS Cozzarelli Prize in 2007 for her paper with Eleanor Ostrom titled Insights on Linking Forests, Trees, and People from the Air, on the Ground, and in the Lab. Now, if that's not interdisciplinary, I don't know what it is. Uh, the Cozzarelli Prize acknowledges papers that reflect scientific excellence and originality. She's also the 2013 Eleanor Ostrom Senior Scholar Award recipient in recognition of her diversity of work, her innovation and her use of different me uh, methodological approaches, as well as her active participation as a practitioner of the commons. With that, I would like to invite Professor Nagendra to deliver her lecture entitled, Urbanization, A New Frontier for Conservation. been a long, I guess, two days, so thank you for showing up in the evening to listen to this uh, third plenary of the sessions. This is a very interesting and, uh, I must say, very exciting SCB for me, looking at how much it, the concept of conservation, the concept of ecology has evolved beyond thinking of animal species, plant species interactions, to looking at the environment, now looking at landscapes, agribusiness, Urban, urbanization, a whole number of different themes that we weren't looking at before. And I'm very pleased, thank you Ted and everyone else for the invitation to be here. Uh, very pleased to be here to talk about some of the work that I've been doing on urbanization and why this is so important for conservation. This is a night night satellite image of the world that some of you may have seen. And really what it shows you is not as much where the people are, but where the cities are. This is a map that is used as a surrogate for population density, but what it really shows you is where the human impact in terms of use of energy and energy intensive use, uh, kinds of uh, you know, buildings, roads, etc., are. And what you can see from this is the massive scale of the urban transition, which now there are very few parts of the world that are unaffected by urban cities. I think we heard on the first day in the inauguration that by 2008 we had crossed the point where 50% of the world now lived in cities. By 2050 we'll be now at a point where 75% of the world lives in cities. 
So what does this mean for conservation? Obviously, this means we need to start looking at cities in a very different way. This can't, it can no longer be that you know, we start thinking of conservation only in areas where there is very little human impact because there is really hardly any place like that. And it's not just the type and scale of human impact. It's also that cities have an impact far beyond their environments, right? They draw in water and energy and food from places across the world and send their waste and other kinds of outputs across the world also. And because of the increased globalization of the world, we can no longer say that when cities have taken too much of their environment, they will collapse and then something else can grow back because everything is so interconnected that pretty much the world as we know it will collapse. So what then does this kind of an urbanization and an urbanized world mean for conservation? It's especially an important issue for Asia. And if you look at where these growing cities are, so this is a map from 2014 from the UN World Urbanization Prospects. What you can see very clearly here is, if you look at where are the growing cities, parts of Africa, but all of Asia really. India and China, of course, account for a bulk of this, but it's not just India and China. Across Asia, the fastest growing cities are there. And if you look at the rest of the world, uh, I was in the urban ecology sets of talks today, and uh, a lot of times the point came up that most of what we know about cities and their urban ecology and their urban environment and their conservation issues has come from cities of the north, North America, Europe. And that's true, but what you'll see from very clearly from this graph is that those are the cities that are largely static. Some, of course, as in the case of Europe, are actually shrinking. And where the new cities and the fast-growing cities are in the place, you know, so these are new parts of the world. We not only know very little about the past, we have no idea about the future. And this has, has been said by many people, including famously by the IPCC, is that it's a threat, but it's also an opportunity to do something different. But only if you understand it can we do something different. Asia already has 50% of the world's urban populations. And uh, this is a number that's projected again to be fairly stable over time from now onwards. So if you're looking from now through 2050, we will have about half the world's urban population. And again, this means that we need to, especially looking at this conference and the focus it has on Asia, that we need to be putting in a lot of effort into seeing what actually constitutes Asian cities and how in any way, if they are different, are they different from other parts of the world, cities in other parts of the world. And do we know enough about this? So these are just photographs of some cities across the world, one is from Singapore, which you can, I'm sure, recognize. But uh, do we know enough about these cities? Where do they get their food from? What kinds of places do people live in? What is their cultural relationship to nature? And how has this, you know, what is the public transport system or the, the private transport? What are the kinds of green roofs like? What are the building structures? We don't know anything about these. And at this point, I'd just like to take a quick poll. How many of you live in cities? Pretty much all, right? How many of you work on cities? Or some part of you work in, you know, in close cities? Which is a pretty high proportion, but I'm guessing that's the nature of this conference. But even here, it's something like 30% of the people in the room, right? And uh, so there's just a lot to be done. And uh, before I start on what uh, some of the work that I'd be doing, I'd like to share with you a personal journey of how this has shaped me as a scientist and as I think uh, Ted's introduction briefly described, urban, the urban field is relatively new. I've been working in it for about 10 years now, but it's not what I started out to do, definitely in my career as an ecologist. And uh, so why did I come here and how has this shaped me? And in many ways it has actually. It shaped not just the research I do, the questions I choose to ask and uh, the things that I think we'll probably go on to do in the future, even in forests. So research in Bangalore was a project that I started, Bangalore being my home city, it's one of uh, India's largest cities, the third largest city, uh, third fastest growing city, uh, the fifth largest city. We're looking at a diversity of land uses, taking a long, deep dive into history, so from the 6th century AD onwards. Also trying to look at a diversity of land uses and seeing how cultures in different places, so private spaces, public spaces, community spaces, how, does, how is nature shaped in all of these and mixed method, which is something that I think is extremely important, obviously, in, the case in cities, but also important everywhere. You know, biodiversity studies, remote sensing and GIS, interviews with people, looking at archival records. But how and when did I start this? 
So from 1993, which is when I started my research work, I've been working on community forests, land change, protected areas, remote sensing for biodiversity, local institutions, all very different from cities, and in different parts of the world. So some a little bit in the US, a little bit in Guatemala and Honduras, some from Nepal, some from different parts of India. Always mostly based in Bangalore and always based in cities, right? And uh, you go therefore into a place which you don't live in, which you're not part of, always with local collaborators, with people who work from the place who had been working there for quite a long time, you know, so people who knew the place very well. But still, when you yourself are not from the place, you go in, you do research, you come back, publish scientifically relevant or policy relevant research, right? But then who takes that policy? Who actually uses it to make any changes? Not that much, it doesn't really get used that much. And uh, I know a few people who have been incredibly successful in getting some of these things done, but that's because they go back to one place year after year, you know, and spend a good chunk of their time. So when they say they live in cities, they also live in the place that they've been working. And when you don't do that, when you're going in and out, it's very hard to really see your work make a difference. So sometime around 2006, 2007, starting to look at, I mean, I think as ecologists, it's, it is a dismal discipline, and conservation also is in some ways. So much of the change that you see has taken place for the worse, and then you start seeing, you know, we've been doing this for several years, and it just gets worse and worse. And where is the, the relevance of all the work that you're doing? So in 2006, I thought of expanding my work, my focus to cities. And it wasn't my work, actually. It was more my personal experiences. I'll give you a couple of examples where it started in 2006. So one was this lake near my house where there was a community-led restoration. I moved to a periable part of the city, built a house there. There was this lovely lake, once lovely. And you can see the photograph on the top. It was, when I moved in 2006, it was basically a dumping ground for solid waste with pigs, with uh, uh, those weeds with a lot of sewage in the place. And uh, then a community-led effort, somebody contacted me. I knew nothing about lakes at that point and never worked on water. And said, here you are, at least you are you know, an ecologist. You can make some maps. Can you make some maps for us? And then we started working together. I made a whole set of friends that are still very, you know, that we work together on a lot of lakes now in the, in the region. So this was something I started with very much not as a researcher, but uh, as someone who's working on this to do something about it, as someone who lives there and part of a community. And that sort of started changing the way I was looking at research, I would say very fundamentally. And uh, so in the bottom left, you can see a photograph. So that's uh, a friend of mine who actually is a documentary filmmaker and started working on this lake and very passionate about it. She still runs the trust that restores the lake. Her kids, my daughter, this is the first time we saw water come into the lake after three years of working on this and restoring it and not seeing anything happen. And so this, again, became a very personal journey. You know, when, And this is part of, I guess, uh, the, the advantage of working in a city. Your field site is very close. And if you have little children, it's very nice to be in a, in a field context where you can keep taking them along. And therefore, you know, it's education. You also, not just with, the, with your own child, but you know, students, school students, college students that you take along, they become involved in the research. And even if something doesn't, you know, not quite what you had envisaged comes about as a policy outcome, you still have education, you have awareness, you have young people who are enthused who are much more uh, passionate about taking things forward. And so things, change happens. The second thing that happened around the same time was uh, a lot of, uh, so Bang the Bangalore Metro was planned at that time. And there were widespread protests about cutting trees. One is on this very iconic heritage road called the Nanda Road, which is a road where I grew up in, in actually my mother's house is close to this place. So again, it started as a very personal journey, became part of this large civic protest that was led by a number of people to save the trees from being cut down on the road. And what they wanted was a simple survey because the government claims were that a very small number of trees would be cut and they were actually you know, not trees that were in good condition. So they wanted an independent survey. And so students and I went out to do this. And again, that's a photograph of my daughter, age one with a bib, which says, save Lal Bagh. So she's, you know, this is a part of, you know, so the personal motivation of this entire protest and being part of this was what we started with. We started looking at lakes, we started looking at trees uh, on streets, and then I suddenly realized, hey, I have all this data. Why don't we start actually making this a research project and trying to see if we can publish some papers. Because 
part of the good part of being a scientist in a city is that when you publish data, it gets more credibility. I mean, it could be something very simple like a tree survey, but if it's you know with with a paper authenticating it, it somehow gets more credibility. So this is some this is where we started, and this is therefore the. The urban journey for me has been very different from my forest research, which I still continue. Because here I see that it's very intertwined. The personal and the professional become very intertwined. And uh, the social and the ecological also become very intertwined. So it's very, in a city it's much more easy I find to get into, or it, you, the, the importance of looking at the social aspects of the research become very prevalent. Because you might be doing some research, Maybe you write something on this, or somebody interviews you, and then you go home and your mother's read this and asking you about it, right? Or a neighbor's read this and wants to know why you think this and has a completely different opinion on it. So you're always engaging with people when you do your research because you live in that context. So having said that, there's one, you know, so the culmination of that is this book which just came out three weeks ago, which is Nature in the City. And this was the idea from the beginning, to write something that would not just be a research-based book, but which is also there in the publications, but to write something for the people of the city, about their own city, and tracing the ecological history of the city. But in this process, I found also, as I said, that uh, the kinds of questions then that I do for a book like this, as opposed to a research paper, are very different. And some of the research questions that we've been addressing through our studies are the questions that you see now, which is, for instance, what is the role of street trees in reducing pollution? How much pollution does, you know, what kinds of species should you be planting? Or if you're looking at native versus exotic species, whether plant or animal or insect, what, what kinds of land use choices influence this distribution of native or exotic species that you see? And how does the plant species composition then influence the insect species composition, for instance? Or a social science question could be if you're looking at a number of places across the city where communities have come together to restore something. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. How can you figure out what are the factors that constrain them in some places or enable them to work in other places, right? So these would be some of the scientific, the science motivated questions. But some of the other things that made their, their ways into the book, which would not have been part of papers, are actually things that people in the city want to know. So for instance, uh, one of the iconic roads where trees were cut because of the metro. What happens to the bamboo vendors? So the bamboo vendors there have been part of the cultural heritage of the city. Everybody knows them and knew them for decades. And now they get resettled because the trees are cut. How does this impact not just how people view the city, but how the you know what happens to the vendors? Where do they go? What has happened to their lives? Or uh, a very famous middle class sort of uh, organizing group of housewives basically who came together in the 1990s and uh, saved a, a very important park of the city from being taken over as a legislator's home. And it was obviously the days before the internet, so they came together, they started a small protest, and then grew into this very large movement that is still very well known in the city. They called it a network of mothers and others. And how does that work to save the city? Again, this is something that people are very interested in. So what I find over this period is that archival stories of myths, of, uh, you know, it, so they could be myths, they could be historical records that we have in maps. Stories of people, stories of places, stories of history, stories basically resonate with people across the city. And therefore what we've been trying to do across this work is a mix of science and storytelling. And uh, then that, again, if you're living in a city which is multicultural, it has to be multilingual as well. So it's in English as well as the local language, which is Kannada. And it's in journals as well as newspapers. And this is an example of you know, different kinds of things that we've done. I'll start with the first one, and that again gives you a sense of, I always find it amusing how people relate in a city to, to work. And the first thing, typically a journalist who covers a story will say, are you from the city? Yes, I'm from the city. No, are you really from the city? Because it has a lot of migrants. Yes, I'm really from the city. And then you go back to where did you go to college? Where did you go to school? Where were your parents? Oh, you're really from the city. And suddenly, that makes everything that you say about the city much more legitimate. I don't know why, but it... And so, I mean, you can see this from this headline, right? Old timer explores Bangalore's equation with changing nature. Somehow the fact that I'm an old timer and I can speak about 40 years of change or whatever that I've seen in the city makes a difference. Now I can say it with some credibility, right? But we've also done, you know, so these little articles in newspapers about ecological histories in Canada, lake walks, so the one below on the left is a lake walk that we did from the lake that I talked to you about, to tell people about the the cultural history of this lake, that it's not just this recreational space that you now see that is restored, but it has this history and how we how it transformed from one 
right, to another. What else were we able to do? So beyond the stories and places, of course, there's a lot of science that goes into this, right? And what we did was, with the science, to try and expand our temporal view. So this is the city of Bangalore, and the typical, you know, the, with your common story or Wikipedia story will start with the red dot right at the center, which is uh, Kempe Gerda, who was a local chieftain in 1537, came to this barren land and saw a hare chasing a hound and thought this was a sign of a, a bravery. So it was a sign of a, an auspicious sign that said, you can construct a city here. And created this market town, De Novo. And this town is, or the city of Bangalore is assumed to be homogeneous. It's now grown hugely from 1537 to 2007. It's, it's, obviously, the growth has been phenomenal. But there were four centuries of settlements before Kempe Garda, And there was a lot of variation in this village. So this is a topographic map of the city. And what you can see is on the west side, you have what is called the Malnad, or the rocky granite. So the, the kind of soil layer that you have is very different. It's rocky, it's granite, it's in the rain shadow of the Western Ghats, it gets less rainfall, the soil is kind of thin. And what you had here was more um, thorny vegetation. So it was dry deciduous. This is, Bangalore is an unusual old settlement city so because it's in a semi-arid zone. It doesn't have a, a large body of water anywhere close by. No river, no coast. Right? And on the eastern side, you have what you call the Maidan, which is the rolling grassy plains. And this is more fertile, suitable to agriculture. You can have, you can create these rainwater reservoirs or tanks, which we now call lakes, which is what they did. And there are four large dynasties that were ruling South India and the Bangalore region before Kempe came in, in 1537. And you can see that they start off with more of the, you know, the eastern side where, they, where you have the grassy plains because they're obviously easier to get into. Then over time, you start getting more and more development till you actually filled out this area. So if you look at this entire picture, and I'll just take you through it, six to nine centuries, the Ganga dynasty, then the Chola dynasty, then the Hoysalas who are big lake builders, and they just do this massive lake construction across the city. And then they start getting much further into the, the hilly parts of the city. And then the Vijayanagara dynasty, and then Kempe Gowda comes in. So well before he comes in, archival evidence itself tells you that there were at least 75 settlements here, and there was a lot of trade going on. So that, that's the first important thing you realize, that this, this landscape, though it was semi-arid, had fertile soils and had a capacity for rainwater harvesting, and which this is why you could actually construct in here. And the, the fact that they dammed water to create these lakes was what let the city flourish. The second thing you realize is that the city is actually two parts. There's the, the hilly part and the plains part. And this is something we forget today, we don't even think of. You can even see the, in the text of the inscriptions, the kinds of inscriptions you find in the grassy plains, talk about a particular landscape which gets repeated in text after text. Okay? They talk about a village with a tank, and the wet and the dry land. So there's irrigation and non-irrigated lands, as well as the wells underground and the trees overground. So this landscape that they're thinking of is a fertile agricultural landscape where the water by the wells and the tanks is as much part of it as the trees above. And in the rocky part, you get a completely different story. You get uh, stories of tiger attacks, of wild boar attacks, of cattle raids, and clearly they, were, they weren't uh, doing agriculture in, these, in, the, in the western part of the city. No, what they were doing is pastoralism. And then you have these great battles that they describe, which are actually cattle raids, you know, of two, two groups fighting each other. Or people going out to raid to tend cattle in the jungle and getting gored by a boar or, or by a tiger. And even today, actually, the places where you found these descriptions of wildlife attacks are the high, uh, high biodiversity areas where the Tiger Park actually is, uh, the National Park today is. So what's happened over time? We've lost this oral memory of the differences between these two parts of the city. And you see that you get a lot of discomfort due to pollution, heat, and water stress. And water is a big part. This is a semi-arid place, as I said, and water scarcity is something that frequently comes up every summer. Are we running out of water? Will the city collapse? Where is it going to go? But there are places to build and places to leave alone, and we still haven't learned this lesson. And the lake that I showed you in the previous photographs that we've restored is now threatened because the wetland below it, uh, sorry, above it, where water comes in from, is getting built up because it is a sensitive zone, but they, the builders have received permissions to build in there. They raised it by 30 feet, and as you can see, these are photographs of flooding from the Facebook page of the Lake Group. 
And so we don't think anymore of the fact that we need to, you know, where are the places you can build? So you might have a granite boulder where you shouldn't be building because it's a particular kind of ecology, particular kind of geography. But you can blast it and build large apartments in a city. And similarly, in a wetland, you can drain it and you can plant trees and fill it up, right? And you can build again. But what are the consequences of the city and where should you be building? We don't think of that anymore. And uh, we, because of all these lakes, we have three lake chains. So the city can be divided into three valleys topographically. And these are, this is how the water flows in the city. And we don't think of the interconnections in this. Yet, if, you know, year after year, we, all we say is that we have less water than before. And we need to keep importing water from the Kaveri River, which is what most of the, a large part of the city does, which is a river that is 100 kilometers away. And water gets pumped by 600 meters of a height provide water to the city. Now why water? Despite the fact <coughs> that there's been so much of talk about or concern about water in a semi-arid city, and this is actually interesting because if you look at climate change and urban ecologies, there's been so much of a focus on coastal cities, but very little on semi-arid cities. And that's a big crisis that is really coming on, I would say already come, but again, we don't focus on this enough. But what the story of Bangalore again shows you over time is that when you lose the local loop of connection, when cities start importing from very far away all the resources or sending their waste very far away, and that local loop is lost, that's when you stop conserving. So what the story of Bangalore beyond Kempe Gauda shows you, there was a succession of rulers. In 1791, the city became British property. For a while, went back again, and in 1799, the British took over. And so you have maps of the city. Of course, the British were good map makers, and uh, as with Singapore, you had good maps the, from 1791 onwards. And these are maps of lakes and trees. And I'd like you to see from 1791 to 1888, you can see the number of lakes have actually increased as of the number of trees. Lakes, because they used to supply the city with water, and you need more lakes. And uh, trees, because it's a hot city, and when you start getting more and more people in there, this is a semi-arid tropical place, and you need more trees for cooling. Over time, in 18, the, so in about 1892-93, the city starts running out of water. It can't deal with its lakes anymore. And it starts getting, the, so the first project when it starts getting water from outside is created. And suddenly you see the discussion in the archives completely changing. Lakes were sacred, life-giving bodies of water. You needed to protect them. And now they become cesspools. They're sources of infection. They're dirty. You need to clean them. You need to fill them in. I mean, the entire discussion in the archives completely, the, the tone completely changes. And they start slowly, systematically filling in these lakes and tanks. Right? What about trees? The city continues to get hotter, so you need trees. And so plantation continues, except in the past 20 years. I mean, this is a map of 2015. There are many more trees than there were in 1888. But we've lost a lot of trees in the past two decades. But having said that, look at lakes. There are very few lakes left. Most of these have been converted into malls, parking areas, apartment complexes, you know, all kinds of built land spaces. And this is because you still need trees within the city, but you don't need lakes anymore because you get your water from outside. And it's only the peri-urban areas where pipe water doesn't reach now that you see citizen groups getting together to protect their lakes because they realize that groundwater, which is where what supplies them, is really getting exhausted and therefore you need lakes to be protected. So yes, you know, in one case sense, you can see less lakes, more trees. But in another sense, what kinds of trees? And that becomes very important. And I did start by talking about natives versus exotics. And the kinds of trees we're getting in the city and the values we put on nature and the use of nature has changed quite a bit over time. From multifunctional uses of nature, we've moved to a very you know, recreation-focused use where we're looking at exotic plants, a particular kind of intensive landscaping and maintenance. So lakes, for instance, were used in diverse ways for washing clothes, for picking up green, harvesting greens from the place, you know, for migrant workers, for cattle, for fishing. Now, most places they're gone, of course. The few places that they are protected, they're used for rejuvenation, for water recharge and recreation, with timings, with guards, with gates, and a whole list of do's and don'ts. No fishing, no swimming, no plucking trees, no plucking branches, you know, you can only do these things. Village forests, they were there uh, around the entire city. They have been either degraded and converted into waste dumps or public utilities or gated parks. Gated parks, very similar again, recreational, gated, only certain kinds of uses allowed. 
streets were once wooded, you planted multifunctional species like mango and tamarind on them, they become, so this is the street with the bamboo weavers that I was talking about. So from a street like this in the 1930s, it becomes a street like this, with only certain kinds of species planted, if at all. Home gardens. Home gardens in Bangalore, very different from many other home garden studies, have a large proportion of used plants. They are used in some form or the other, either for sacred, you know, for worship or for uh, herbs or for cooking or for eating or something, some, something. But most of these are moving to apartments and the kinds of uh, plants that they are manicured, so it's manicured lawns, palms, mostly exotic, or variegated plants because they're easy to maintain and you don't have to clean up the, you know, the, the fruits and the things. Where does nature survive then in its multifunctional form? In two places. So one is slums. And slums, because of the nature of their, you know, because they're small cohesive units, and these are the older slums in the city, of course, not the new ones where the new migrants come. But if people have been there for 40, 50, 60 years and they have some secure land tenure, then they start planting trees around where they are. And the highest proportion of local species and the highest proportion of used species that we saw were in the slums. Because people, when you plant in such narrow spaces, you want something that you can use. And they really plant in all kinds. It could be paint buckets or you know, broken down utensils, whatever you find in what place, whatever place you find, people grow this. And the second is sacred places. Across all faiths, you might have a Muslim cemetery, you might have a church, you might have a temple. But these are very resilient spaces, again, for biodiversity because of the range of cultural practices, you know, leaving some food out for the goats or for the birds or sugar for the ants. This is a photograph from a temple which, where there's a natural water spring that comes out through the mouth of the bull and there's a pigeon which is uh, drinking from this. So sacred spaces, again, you find a very high proportion of native species and very organically conserved by communities. And then so what? I mean, is this a story of one city? Why does it matter to any, anyone else from another city? So I just start with one story of parallels. I mean, there are many, so many parallels between cities that always strike me when I go to a different place. But this is, you know, this is a photograph that I often show to talk about peri-urban spaces where the, this is a sacred uh, platform where you have sacred trees, and this is a peri-urban village space. And in there, Arnold Schwarzenegger is advertising a gym. So it's a, you know, very good example of globalization that I often use while teaching. <laughs> I showed this in Thailand at the at the UTEC conference. Went for a walk. And see, this is what I find in Thailand. Arnold Schwarzenegger's advertising a gym there also. So there are many parallels. I mean, this is of course not urban ecology, but so many parallels that you find in the specifics of this story with people who who I've talked to from London, looking at Taipei, looking at Dhaka, looking at so many cities across the world. And certainly, I would think, especially the cities in Asia, because of a few things, because we have this very living and rich cultural heritage, and we also have this desire to be modern and to do it very fast, right? And so the, how, the sort of combination of these two opposing forces which somehow seem to both survive in the city. How do we do with this? And in this process, how does, where does nature thrive and where does nature strive? If you look at current visions for cities and their environments, there's so much of a discussion about smart cities globally and in Asia also. And the other challenge that Asian cities especially have is of urban inequity and social injustice. And this is something that is extremely exacerbated by the kinds of patterns of loss of multifunctional nature, right? Because when you have fruits and fodder and fuel wood and fish available, who uses it? It's practitioners of traditional livelihoods. And it's migrant workers who don't have any place else. And in interviews after interviews with different kinds of people across the city, we found that this is why, for instance, people in slums protect their trees so fiercely, because they use them. Their kids you know, have feed off of these. So if you have access to a lake and you have a village community there or a slum there, the greens from that lake actually feed their children. And if they can't, they can't afford to buy greens. So the levels of malnutrition are very high. So the social justice implications of changing to recreation-focused nature protection are very strong. And especially if you're thinking of smart cities and thinking of the fact of you know, what happens to the poor in the smart cities who can't afford to be smart. Maybe you need ecologically smart cities, which are which act as urban commons which people can protect of various kinds. And if you look at the ecosystem services framework, and you see, I think city after city, if you read planning documents, either they don't talk about nature much, or when they do talk about nature, they talk about supporting services, they talk about regulatory services, and in the cultural, they focus only on the aesthetic. Right? But 
provisioning services seem to be completely getting out of the discussion of urban city planning across all cities. I mean, the, the, the argument you keep hearing from, from city planners is that cities are not the place. You can have um, these new kinds of food gardens that you have, right? You take over a parking lot and you can. But why not the streets, the trees on the streets or the trees in any common lot that you find which are food, you know, why can't they be growing fuel wood or fruits or medicinal plants? That kind of concept, which used to be there in many parts of the world, is now going away. And so the focus on provisioning services is therefore related to the focus on urban commons, because when you're thinking of commons, why do you get together as a community? Not just for fresh air or for water, but something that I can actually use, right? And uh, this is something that unfortunately seems to be not considered in the whole smart city issue. So in conclusion, what, we, what the story of Banyol is the story, I would argue, of cities around the world, because what you see is three trajectories really of urban ecosystem change. One is, of course, that ecosystems get degraded. They get destroyed. And that's when the local cycle, as I was saying, gets broken, when you don't no longer use, use it or you don't see that you need to use it. And then it becomes just an open space. It's a wasteland that can be grabbed by real estate. And that is the tragedy of the commons. The second is when they get protected and restored. But when they get protected and restored, they get simplified in a certain way. The species diversity that they have gets hugely reduced. And this is a focus on recreational services, which also you know, removes the traditional organic connect. So for instance, the spiritual connect in, ba in Bangalore, where it could be various other kinds of cultural connects in various other Asian cities. And that is a connect often to specific species, which tend to be native species of that region, right? The third is the maintenance which you need of these systems. So you can have a city that's urbanizing, but you have pockets of remnant forests or remnant uh, village groves which are managed by people, but managed in much more multifunctional ways. And for this, we really need to encourage the urban commons. So I conclude with this, that we need to begin, to begin with, A, just broaden our focus, I think. And uh, a lot of the very rich discussions at this conference have uh, been very nice in seeing how, I think ecology has come a long way. About, uh, in the past 10 or 15 years, there's been so much of a focus on urban ecology, which is just beginning to grow. But equally strongly, we need urban scholars, scholars of cities, to recognize that nature is a legitimate and important part of the city. Because that gets left out. If you look at you know, stories of cities across the world, nature is just a sub-story somewhere tucked away into the margins. And finally, just that the path forward needs to be that we have an ecologically smart city. Because our cities are growing, and I don't think we can change that. But how can we make them ecologically smart so that we think of nature as a very functional commons where you combine the roles of ecology and the important role of social justice in a city. And uh, nature can do this very well. So I'll just end with this. And of course, if you want more about Bangalore, you can read on this. But I'm happy to answer more questions. Uh, thank you, Harini. Uh, we have time for questions, so please, uh, you can use the microphones, or if you don't want to use the microphone, just speak loudly. planners, either in the government or in non-governmental agencies like the Mumbai Guru Foundation and places like that to actually affect the change? Yeah. Uh, so in a lot of ways, uh, number by Guru Foundation or for the city planning, it, um, the city planners themselves, for instance, struggle with uh, real estate development and PIL. So one thing that I find myself doing very frequently is to write uh, environmental reports that go into either Nama Bangalore PILs or even uh, forest department or state government PILs against developers. But also a number of other things. We've been working with the lake department of the of BBMP for a while, trying to talk about how you need to redesign the lake, you know, lake restoration ideas and a uh, variety of things on uh, these uh, committees now for, that look against uh, at the whole metro tree felling issue. So a lot of the, the number of ways that we've been working with the city planners, some are more successful than others. So lake restoration has been actually much more successful, I would say, because partly there's a political economy angle, right? I mean, even you have big money goes into lake restoration projects. So if you can also advise someone how to do that better, the advice gets taken. 
but it's harder to influence uh, or to stop tree felling for a big road widening project because then the big money is going into the road widening project and it's very difficult to, to really influence that. But some of the things, I mean, principles like plant, just simple things like plant more types of species, <laughs> plant more trees on roads, you know, it's a very simple thing that you can actually try and get into a city. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I really, really like to hear about ecologically smart cities. Um, I'm just worried about the fact that cities often also contain very uh, rare species, uh, species which are very low, low in abundance mm -hmm. because it's been naturally been degraded and these, these populations have had to shrink into a city environment. And there's a juxtaposition perhaps of um, planning an ecologically smart city which maximises the ecosystem services such as provisioning services to really focus on common species, abundant species to provide those services. So I'm just wondering how do you join those perhaps um, competing forces? True, and uh, I would think, I mean, as with protected areas or anything, that you would have a mix of areas set aside for different things. So Bangalore, for instance, would have and has two important botanical heritage gardens. And they wouldn't be, you know, they would be retained as such, right? Because they, they're protected, you can't do much in there. But there are many other sites where parks, for instance, are getting extremely simplified, where you have just grassy lawns and a lot of pesticides and, uh, you know, tankers of water coming into walk, and no trees. And so those are the kinds of areas that you can really make a food forest. And uh, thank you for uh, nice question, ma'am. Uh, in Bangalore, uh, nowadays uh, we have a problematic with uh, this uh, going uh, lakes and uh, in the water floating regions they get foam and it it, it will get catches by itself mm -hmm. in the morning also. What are the main causes of this uh, foaming and uh, catching by and the control measures? Okay, so that's getting very specific and I can talk in more detail later, but uh, a lot of the foam is because of uh, just uh, detergents that people send in. So in a, in a large city when you don't have, a, especially in the peripheral part of the city when you don't have an underground sewage system, all the detergent that the city uses flow, flows into the lake, so that is a big problem. Thanks, thank you. It's very, very interesting. One of the criticisms we've been having in Delhi recently where we are making a lot of biodiversity parks and city forests mm -hmm. is that these small areas are ecological traps and you know species survive there but it's just a very limited sort of time that they survive in and they can't disperse. So how do we count, how would you counter that as an urban ecologist? Thanks. I've heard this offer in Bangalore also and uh, to begin with, I must say I'm not convinced because I haven't seen the hard data, especially in, in Indian cities of this. You know. So you, I think we need good comparisons and we haven't done good comparative studies. We see that many of the species that are in city parks don't do it. But what is the proportion of that happening also in, you know, in, in more for, sort of uh, uh, original remnant forests, for instance? So we don't, we don't know. But the second thing is, I think if you have stepping stone areas and you look at that, that's a you know one big thing that these small city parks can do. Just act as stepping stones for to restore connectivity between large places that will not act as things. And if we think of them that way, then it's still fine. And uh, again, the problem with our cities is we never design them at the landscape level, and they should be the obvious targets for landscaping. I mean, at the designing at the landscape level, right? We think of each individual pocket. Thank you for your talk. I have a question about, do you think it is a good idea to combine the green architecture into the um, urban eco ecology and design for the urban planning? To combine what into? Green buildings, green architectures, mm -hmm. and uh, to become um, for the urban designing, urban planning. We had a nice talk on green roofs just before this. Depends, I think it, um, so much is in the detail, right? What kinds of species you plant, what do you mean by green buildings? So if you're looking at LEED certified buildings, for instance, in many tropical countries like Bangalore, I would assume like Singapore, they're LEED certified for energy, which means you have glass fronted buildings and then you use a lot of water that you, in a, in a semi-arid environment to wash the, the windows. So it, it sort of depends on what you mean by green. If you're looking at uh, you know, green walls, green roofs, I would say there's a lot of potential there, but it's really not, not been explored enough. But again, I've also, it, again, it depends on, on the kinds of, you know, are you using soil, are you using uh, a lot of pesticides, or uh, 
fertilizers, so much is in the detail. Anybody else with a question? Policy documents for many cities are pretty good. So if you look at all our cities in on average, the per capita green space that they've been recommending for people have grown, I think, from one or two hectares per person in the 80s to something like 10 to 12 hectares now. But the percentage of per capita green space has actually gone down. You know, while, while the percentage recommended in planning has gone up, the real percentage available has really gone down over time. So I think it's the, sometimes the plans are pretty good. For Bangalore, definitely the plans are really good. And they say things like, here's a sensitive zone, don't build. But then they also say that the BDA can give you permission to build in a sensitive zone. And the ecological and social sensitive zones are very carefully defined. So they might give you permission to build in an ecological sensitive zone by saying, you here, have some housing for the poor, and that's fine. And uh, you can't challenge that then. So I think there's a lot of deliberate obfuscation that goes on then in these documents that uh, yeah, but we need much more planning. If you look at any of the smart city documents, there's nothing about greenery ex except from some very token, let's plant lots of trees. Okay, one, one, one question here. So as you, as you said, you know, such a large population uh, proportion of the Population is going to live in cities, but even now, uh, a disproportionate amount of uh, people with power live in cities uh, from academics to administrators to politicians. And these are the people who make decisions not just about environment in cities alone, but about, about all of you know, uh, all of the earth. So, in some sense, could you just speak, you could you just tell us a little bit about you know, how you know, focusing on urban ecologies might really have impacts on larger environmental movements, you know. In, Big question with a lot of implications. Yes, very true. If uh, I mean, so much of the planning process, it's actually problematic because it's subverted by power, and especially so in cities. And when you have um, uh, para bodies, which are you know sort of experts, planning experts, who often turn out to be rich people from you know wealthy companies or influential people who tell you how to plan the city, and of course they're planning for the cars and they're planning from their point of view, not planning for others. So that. I think makes a big difference. One of the things we've been trying to do with, uh, which, where we, which we found most successful, the other part of Indian cities, in, and I, maybe this is, I guess this is true of Asian cities across the world, is that uh, they're changing in a way that there are so many barriers now that you don't see the other half of the city and you don't see how the other half lives, which was not true of you know, 20, 30 years ago. So it's more like US cities in, in a sense. You might never go to an inner city area and you might never realize that poverty exists to this extreme form in your city. And so one of the things we've been doing is uh, we had a photo exhibition, for instance, where we had people that we've been interviewing with their photo car telling their own story bilingually in Kannada and English and put it in a place like a metro station where people are walking off the street. Right? They're not, you're not preaching to the choir, which we often do, and uh, you just find people who randomly walk off the street and see that they're seeing a photo exhibition. And then you get the people whose stories are being told to come there and stand next to the photographs. And I think we need to do more things like this where you, you just don't even see a side of the city that exists and it's completely invisible. So I don't know, that, that probably doesn't answer all of your question, but some of it. Okay, so on behalf of uh, Conservation Asia and of the organizing committee and everyone here, I'd like to thank you, Harini, for making the journey here and, and giving us your, uh, your thoughts on urban ecology. Uh, thank you for coming.